Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I hope you can all see my screen and hear me well. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, it's amazing how this conference is going so far. And uh, yeah, many thanks to all the organizers and moderators doing these jobs. And I have the pleasure to talk a little bit more about work we are doing with TESS on uh, finding potentially habitable, most likely uninhabitable M dwarf worlds and what stellar flares have to do with that. So that second picture is probably how things look around M dwarfs. But first I want to motivate a little bit how flares can impact life and why we should care if we want to look for Earth-sized planets around M dwarfs. I think everybody here and uh, in the exoplanet field knows that flares can be a danger for small exoplanets in the habitable zones of M dwarf stars. For example, the most massive stellar flare that was found on our sun was the Carrington event 150 years ago, and that delivered an energy of 10 to the 34 Earth. Compared with that, an average super flare on M dwarf star uh, goes up to 10 to the 38 Earth, maybe 10 to the 39 and sometimes. So that's four to five orders of magnitude higher in energy. And now imagine not being on a one year orbit, but being on a one week orbit for the habitable zone. So constantly get bombarded with these massive, massive flares. And that can blow off the atmosphere, that can sterilize the surfaces. It also delivers charged particle streams through the coronal mass ejections. And there's a lot of impacts to the negative, but a couple of laboratory studies that dig into how we can trigger prebiotic chemistry, uh, led by Paul Rimmer, the, the Sutherland group, um, Dimitar Sasselov, Sukhradranchan, and others, they find actually that we might need a certain amount of UV energy coming from flares to trigger prebiotic chemistry processes and the precursors of RNA um, around M dwarf worlds. Now, it's this kind of like interplay that fascinates me and it's like, where is the sweet spot, um, assuming there is a sweet spot between the danger and the kind of potential necessity. So again, this is one pathway to life, not necessarily the pathway to life. But where does TESS come into all this? And that's uh, what I'm going to talk about now is like, how can we find flares with TESS and what do we do with them when we find them? Now, as many of you already know from George Rickers and other people's talks, TESS is an all sky survey, kind of the successor of the Kepler mission, but with a different focus, not staring at one field of view, trying to find exoplanets around sun-like stars, but actually scanning the entire sky. And that's what we see in this little diagram here. TESS goes with 13 sectors through the southern hemisphere and then with 13 sectors the northern hemisphere and that's actually what TESS has just finished a couple of weeks ago now moving on into the extended mission uh, year number three and how does a flare in TESS look like very different from uh, what we know for flare studies in the x-ray etc but here we see a little um, CCD snippet of text a couple of pixels and that bright dot that you see down there is not the flare that bright dot is just a boring normal star um, the little white region that I marked here, that's where the flare appears and suddenly brightens up the detector and then disappears again after a couple of hours. And if we translate this, if we extract the information from the pixels, put it into a light curve, this is how a light curve looks like. And that was actually the largest flare that we found back in our test sector one and two um, data. And that was a flux increase. If we actually model this flare profile and we calculate the real peak, it was a flux increase of like 16, 17 fold. But that's incredible. Imagine like the sun getting brighter by a factor of 17 suddenly for one or two hours. Now, this is not even the largest flare. Like now digging through the test year one and two data where we have 26 instead of two sectors, uh, we actually find flares that have like 30, 40 fold flux increase. But how do we do this? How do we find flares? So this is a typical light curve that actually comes from one of the candidates. And you see there's a lot of um, rotational modulation that's due to spots and I marked a couple of uh, flares here with yellow stars just to pick them out. There's a lot of smaller ones in there as well. In our previous studies and a couple of other studies, a general approach is always to look at uh, this in kind of like the same way as we look for exoplanets. So we have some trend filtering, uh, model this out for example with splines or sinusoids etc. Um, we have an outlier detection where we just find what's lying above the threshold and then we performed some model fitting. And here in the test year one and two paper, we actually used Alice Fitter and uh, nested sampling to model the profiles uh, using Jim Davenport's um, empirical flare model and uh, to run also models for noise and just see like, is what this little peak that we see here, 
Um, is there enough Bayesian information in there to say this is actually a flare or is the noise model preferred as like the simpler model that can explain those few points that are outliers. Um, now, obviously, the whole field has started to move more into machine learning approaches, especially if we handle monstrous data like years and years of tests observations. And uh, actually, Adina Feinstein has uh, spearheaded an amazing effort on developing a neural network um, flare detection pipeline called Stella. Um, I very much encourage you to check out Adina's poster and uh, get in touch with her about uh, how to employ this and uh, her work on this. And this is actually what I started now to use also to dig more into the test year and one, two data because the sector one and two um, really model fitting everything, describing with patient evidence takes a long time. A neural network, once trained, runs very, very fast and has the big advantage that it gives you probabilities also. So you don't have just a um, yes or no decision on whether something is a flare or not, but you can actually say, okay, I'm 70% sure this is a flare. And I'll come to that in a second. Now I want to get more into like, we found these flares, what's different? What can tests contribute? Like we had flare studies for decades. Um, Kepler has done amazing work on flare studies in, in a large quantity. Other studies have done amazing detailed work on uh, small samples. Where does test come in? Uh, and here's a little um, plot that illustrates that. So on the x-axis, we have the effective temperature of stars. And on the y-axis, we have the test magnitude. How bright is that object? And then on the upper y-axis, I just translated the effective temperature roughly into FGKM star categories. And this is what Kepler found. It's a nice, um, nice clusters here, actually, like around the F stars, a couple of G stars, all pretty faint, which is exactly due to Kepler's observing strategy, and a good bunch of K stars as well, because the flaring actually like ramps up as we go to later spectral types. Now, this is where our test sector one and two study comes in that we uh, put up on the archive last year and that uh, was published in the journal early this year. And we see there's a lot of improvement. If I flip back and forth between those two, Kepler didn't really scan this region of M-dwarfs because they were not the main focus of the mission. They are the main focus of the test mission and they are the ones that are really flaring. So we already add a lot of targets here. But now going from sectors one and two to year one and two, so from two to 26 sectors, or actually I understand 23 in this case. You see the difference, especially in the histograms. If I flip back between this and that, we see the entire diagram is full now. And if you look at the histogram that's up, uh, the upper histogram, then you see a massive difference between what we see in year one and two versus sectors one and two, because we have 13 fold more data. And now comes the nice part of using a neural network actually, is where we can compare, these are all the targets that I consider confirmed here, um, where literally I look at that flare and it has a more than 90% uh, probability given by the neural network telling me, okay, there is a flare. If I say I lower this threshold and I accept everything where the neural network says more than 50% sure, so basically it has a higher probability to be a flare than to be noise, and then we add all these targets to the game. And that's a huge improvement and it's the, the biggest sample of flaring M dwarfs that we ever had and that we can study. Now, what can we do with all this? Well, we can and do in these papers study rotation versus flaring, age versus flaring, for example, getting the age from uh, known uh, from the literature, from known publications or um, from cluster memberships and young association memberships. We can study spectral type versus flaring we can study the flare energies, we can study the flare energy distributions, but most importantly, we can connect flares to habitability. And that's what I wanna really dwell on in the last few minutes that I have, is how do we connect flares to life? We have this massive sample of tens of thousands of flaring stars, and we look for exoplanets around them, and we actually like find exoplanets around them, but what do we do then? And this is where we go back to the light curve and we look at this and say we have taken 100 days of observation, so a few test sectors of a given star, and we pick out what is the biggest flare here. This has like 10 to the 37 Earth, which is quite an average value for a super flaring M dwarf. And now we translate this into a flare frequency diagram. On the X axis, we see the log 10 of the bolometric flare energy. And there's a lot of magic happening in between translating from tests into this diagram into volumetric energy. 
Um, and I can ask, uh, answer a little bit about that in the, in the questions. And there's very much open field to, for improvement. But on the y-axis of this diagram, we see basically the cumulative flare rate, which is flare rate um, number of flares that have a given energy. Now we translate this point, we have one flare per 100 days with an energy more than 10 to the 37 ERC. Good, next flare, 10 to the 35.5. So we have two flares per 100 days that have at least 10 to the 35.5 uh, ERC energy. And so on and so on. And I keep adding more and more points and build up this cumulative distribution and can fit a slope to it. We've already heard in other talks about flares. We can uh, very well describe these in a log log diagram as uh, straight lines, as we physicists tend to do all the time anyway. And we then come connect what we see in photometric observations with tests with what we know from prebiotic chemistry laboratory studies and say, these flares deliver enough UV energy if we make, again, certain assumptions to trigger prebiotic chemistry that was described by uh, Rimet, Al, and Sutherland group. But also we can compare this, for example, with uh, Matilli's study and the uh, Segura group studies of ozone sterilization and say, these flares come with so much, uh, so many charged particles that lead to uh, ozone dissociation and then sterilization of subsequent uh, flares of the surface. What we can do now is we take these tens of thousands of M dwarfs that we found and we put them into these diagrams and we see where their lines intersect. Where do we have an M dwarf like this uh, red curve that I'm showing here that actually does not intersect the ozone sterilization zone but intersects with the prebiotic chemistry in reasonable time scales. So where could we trigger life but not destroy life? And in the very last uh, minute of this talk, I'm just gonna say, currently it looks as like a bit less than 1% of all test M dwarf actually tick this box. So they would allow this kind of way of life. Again, this is one of many hypotheses of how we could trigger origin of life on exoplanets. And you all know that uh, much better than me as uh, experts in habitability and biosignatures. Um, but this is one of the ways that we can probe already. And I'm very keen to like chat more and see what else can we bring into these diagrams? What else can we connect to the test data? And with this, I think I'm running over time already. So I'm gonna skip over my last two slides and just leave up my conclusion. And uh, thank you very much.